before we go to the Lord in prayer, before I start the message, um, many of you know, uh, Minnie Pearl always used to make fun of her brother, you know, and she always used to call him nothing but brother. That was it. And uh, she was telling the story one day about visiting with some people and about how brother finally made it to college. And she was asked, well, so what's brother studying? And he said, well, she ain't, he ain't studying nothing. They're studying him. <laughs> Would you join me in prayer? Father, as we open up your word, as we share together, we ask for your blessing upon us. We thank you for the way you work in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the truth that your word holds for us. May you bless us and be with us. May we faithfully see what you have to show us. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, in the Bible, and we have talked about this, there are a number of biblical truths that we need to make sure we never surrender on. And this is especially important when it comes to the two moments that we're going to talk about, because we're going to talk about the incarnation of Jesus, or His birth, and the crucifixion, His death. Christmas must always be celebrated with the thoughts of Easter in mind. The cradle in a stable, are providing a resting place for a little baby, must always be looked at together with a beaten man hanging on the cross. Am I going in and out? Okay, because I, all right, I'm good. I just, it was all of a sudden I could hear myself and then I couldn't and I was just confusing, which sometimes isn't hard, but I won't admit that. Um, in the passage we're looking at today, Jesus tells a story. And we should not and cannot miss the meeting. God sent His Son, and we killed Him. There is a murder in the vineyard, and we know who commits the crime. We're going to look at a passage, a very familiar passage in the Old Testament, that Jesus tells a story that is really about Him. It's drawn from this passage. I'm going to ask you to look at Isaiah chapter 5, 1 through 7 with me. Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 begins, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard, on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared it out, cleared out its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst, and also made a wine press in it, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, O men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you, what will I do to my vineyard? I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned, and break down its walls and it shall be trampled. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I also command the clouds that there shall be no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. The man who plants the vineyard is God the Father. The vineyard is Israel. The tenants are the religious leaders of Israel. The servants are the faithful prophets. And the beloved Son is Jesus. God is incredibly pre pl wow. God is incredibly patient 
even when servants, even when sinners, resist calling. Now look at today's main passage, Mark 12, 1 through 12. This is Jesus sharing a very related story. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time he sent a servant to the wine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the wine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again he sent another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. Again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore having one son, his beloved, he also sent them last, saying, They will respect my son. But these wine dressers. Among, said among themselves, This is the heir. Come and let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. The, they, so they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the wine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stones which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in his eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. A parable in Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary is described as a short, simple story designed to communicate a spiritual truth, religious principle, or moral lesson. They were used by Jesus many, many times to share truths. An example of them being shared more by, uh, by others than just Jesus is when the prophet Nathan approached King David and he shared and told about a single sheep. And David recognized that. Nathan did this dealing with the sin of King David. The parable that we're looking at today is the story of Israel's relationship to God and a reminder of God's incredible patience. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God planted a nation called Israel in a special vineyard. In spite of the fact that He planted her, put some protective fencing, a tower, she did not produce good things, but bad. The landowner had made an agreement with the ten tenement farmers. That agreement was they would provide. They would take care of the land. That they would be reliable caretakers. They would work the vintage, vineyards, ven benefit from the produce and pay a percentage of the harvest to him as rent. In order for the landowner to retain legal rights to his property, he had to receive something from the tenants. So as we see in today's message, man planted a vineyard, set a hedge, dug around it, built a tower, and let others come in to run it. And when it came time, for harvest, he sends a servant to collect what rightly belongs to him. 
they take the servant, beat him, and send him away empty-handed. The landowner sends a second servant, who they treat even worse. In gracious and long-suffering, the landowner sends yet a third. And the response of the tenants escalates, and they kill him. And on and on, with so many others, some they beat, some they kill. The landowner is patient. These faithful servants represent the prophets sent by the Lord over and over again. Some they beat, some they kill, some they ignore. God's gracious repentance was extended continuously, repeatedly. But rebellious sinners resisted His calling. We took what was His in rebellion and refused to give back to Him. The Father then sends His Son. He sent the one that He loves the one that they should have honored and that we should honor. And if you haven't figured it out here, we're looking at a parallel between them and between us. They took the very Son and killed Him. They were very, and I'm going to use the word, rebellious here. God has been patient with the nation of Israel. God was patient and patient and patient. And God is patient with us. In 6, we see a remarkable turn. It continues the amazing patience of God, God's long-suffering with humanity. Jesus is talking at this moment to the religious leaders. And you notice as you get to the end of the parable, they understood who Jesus was talking about. They didn't miss it, not one little bit. They understood He was talking about them. The landowner, the landowner now becomes a father in this final attempt. He sends his, on a mission, a beloved son. The phrase beloved son is filled with biblical significance. It's also used as an only son. Verses 1 through 5 show the hope of God for His people. Verse 6 shows the loving kindness of God for His people. The Father sent His Son as an act of grace. Now, one author that I read said, seeing the Son seeing that the Father sent the Son, the tenants maybe thought that He was dead, that the Father was dead and that the Son was now coming. So they assumed, hey, we kill Him, it's all ours. But that's not the case. The foolishness that they had, the evil in their hearts, would lead to their own downfall. They thought if they assassinated his son, they could claim the property as their own. John 1.11 comes to mind here. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. To reject the son is to reject the one who sent him. And it's nothing less and I will use these words here, to reject Jesus is nothing less than spiritual insanity. Even though people they 
believe they can escape ju God's judgment, God's judgment will certainly come. The one rejected and murdered will be vindicated. We respond to this change in events and how we respond could not be more important. Historically, God judged the religious leaders and their nation for the rejection of the Son. In A.D. 70, Jerusalem was absolutely destroyed. Jesus prophesied that in the temple there would not be one stone left upon another. Today, that same judgment falls on all who have rejected. Look at Hebrews 10.29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose that he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Jesus quotes Psalm 118 here, and we're going to look at that. Psalm 118, 22, and 23. The stones which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Changing the theme from a vineyard to a building, Jesus continues to focus on being rejected. The stone rejected would become a well-known symbol for the Messiah. The Jews rejected Jesus. They rejected the stone and cast it aside as worthless or of no value. They beat Him. They crucified Him. God, however, in a marvelous reversal, takes whom they have rejected and makes absolutely chief cornerstone. Literally, the head of the corner. The keystone. And as I was reading on this, they said that what they would do was when they were making a building, they would take one stone, the cornerstone, and they would make it absolutely as humanly perfect as they could make it. Because on that stone rested all of the support, all of the lines of the building. If that stone was crooked, everything else would be crooked. Well, we know our Lord and Savior is not crooked. He is absolutely perfect. And on Him is built the church that follows Him in faithfulness. Jesus' rejection, humiliation, crucifixion appears to be a tragedy until you recognize what He has done. Because God used it for a greater purpose. And as it says, this came from the Lord and is wonderful is marvelous in our eyes. The two stories, the story of the vineyard, the story of the building, are both designed for one simple truth. God is long-suffering. God is patient. God has not given up on anyone as long as we draw breath, we have the ability to be faithful, to recognize Him, to serve Him, to accept Him. It's after we finish drawing breath that we have no more ability to choose life. The stone which the builders rejected, the stone which the church rejected, is built on is Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior and giver of life.
going right along with this, we have this morning communion. We partake of this to remember the sacrifice of our Savior. Now I will tell you, as the men who are going to serve are coming forward, I will tell you that we practice open communion here. It is for every member of the family of God. You do not have to be a member of this church to partake with us. We do this to remember our Savior, what He has done. We do this to remember the love of God that surpasses the love that we'll ever know. Men, would you come forward? Our world, there once was a cross. And hanging on it was someone greater and more wonderful than the whole world. It was the Lord's doing. It was wonderful and perfect. For it is His doing for us. I trust that each of us know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That you've accepted the greatest gift, the gift of salvation. If you have not, then I invite you today to make that choice and choose life. Choose life eternal. We are closing singing song 222. There is a fountain. One of my favorite kind of invitation songs. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 5 of that song. And if I can show you Jesus, I invite you to let me do that today. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath the blood, moved all their guilty stains. Moved all their guilty stains. Moved all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath the blood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and then may I, though by sea, wash all my sins away. When the forest springs stammering tongue, my silent in the grave. There in a noble sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to sing. I'll sing thy power to sing. I'll sing thy power to sing. And in a noble sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. By way of announcement, I would like to tell you, I know some of you expected the next piece of the church constitution today. I cannot tell you everything about it, but I felt the need to present this message today. So next week, we will get to the next piece of our constitution. And we're doing this, and I, I have to share this with you. There's a madness to the method here. Because the first Sunday in March, we get to the church ordinances in the Constitution, which is baptism and Lord's Supper. 
and we are going to hold a baptism service the first Sunday in March. I have a couple who are going to come for baptism, but if you have never been, I invite you to consider being part of that service today. Or not today, obviously. That day. That day. Okay. <laughs> I, I said that wrong. I'm sorry. I, I, I lack a little bit of perfection there. You probably know that. Um, but first Sunday in March, we will be having a baptism service. So if you're interested, please see me. Be more than happy to have you join it. Join us for that. Now, would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for blessing us with your presence, with your word. Father, I thank you that you can use even a tongue like mine to speak your praise and your greatness. Bless us as we seek to serve you, to be your people. In the name of Jesus, amen.